they only showing you what they want to show. You know, it doesn't show you the struggles and stuff. And even if you would want to be number one, um, don't rush it, man. There's no point rushing these things, especially art. If you if you're gonna work in art, it's gonna it's, hopefully it's gonna be a lifetime sort of. It's gonna be a full time career. You know, it's gonna last you for your entire life. So take your time. Don't rush these things. I know everyone wants to be a celebrity, but um, that's that's just not the real end goal. It's it's about self development at the end of the day. So how in tune are you with your own strengths and weaknesses? Simply knowing this can be critical to unlocking your creative potential or even ensuring you stay sane in your career. This is something we discuss at length with our next guest, concept and visual development artist, Henry Wong. Henry has worked on titles such as Across the Spider-Verse, whilst working for some of the biggest studios across the industry. Simply put, Henry is prolific. And in this episode, Henry talks about how being prolific led to amazing highs and low moments in his career, while sharing how he worked through and overcame them to emerge with a healthy perspective on life and his overall creative journey. Let's go. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Learn Squared podcast and I'm delighted to welcome on today's guest, Henry Wong. Welcome Henry. Hey, thanks for having me, Aaron. Thanks for jumping on. Looking forward to speaking with you. I've um, been a big fan of your work since I discovered your work. Um, but for anyone that's listening right now who's completely fresh to our industry and to your work in general, I'll be grateful if you could give everyone a quick introduction to yourself. Sure. Uh, I'm a concept artist and a visual development artist in uh, games and animation. I've been doing this for about eight years now i think mm -hmm. and i've been freelancing for about four or five years so cool um yeah. which one do you prefer like i guess freelance did you make the jump because that was your thing that you wanted to do or was that just like a necessity thing how did the freelance journey happen and which one do you prefer yeah so uh it's a bit complicated i do enjoy the old studio life uh um but I think when I went to freelance, I got paid a lot more and I was about to get married around that time. So right. I needed money a lot. So I had to switch to full-time freelance. Uh, studio life was great. I love meeting all my friends, mentors, coworkers, and it's always good having feedback and stuff. But mm -hmm. like, yeah, uh, you know, that studio life and commuting in London just wasn't, wasn't for me. So mm. yeah having having that extra hour of sleep and staying staying in bed it's just been great what was your commute like well, obviously in previous jobs i've had i've always had commutes even at like university and stuff there's always been a commute and when you don't have to commute that that's you cherish that but what was your commute like like how long was it in a day sometimes? yeah so our the old studio uh was based in holborn uh central london yeah. and i lived in south london i think all the way in Balham or Clapham, I think. Right. Um, it was for in rush hour. It would be anywhere between an hour and an hour and a half. Um, packed. These trains were like packed like sardines, and so they were hot. <laughs> and, and I did that every day for about five years at that yeah. three five years at that studio, man. So, uh, yeah, I yeah I was really happy at that when I didn't have to do that. Yeah, anymore, man. So. Sorry, and I know this is supposed to be an art chat, but um, we might make this a uh, com uh, com commute podcast. But um, <laughs> the, sard <laughs> yeah, that's good. The, the sardines bit is like, yeah, I used to purposely sometimes get up an extra hour earlier just so I could miss the rush hour. My journey was only like, let's say half an hour with a little bit of walking. Um, but I just anything to avoid the sardineness, yeah. I tried to do it when I could. And when it happened, yeah, that was the worst, the longest 30 minutes of my life when it happened. Yeah, for sure. Especially when you add it up, you know, like two or three hours of your day, every day. Yeah, man. <laughs> you just lose it just yes. for no reason. <laughs> I, I mean, I can listen to the podcast and music. But... Yeah, true, true. But it's not the same. No, when no. You're, like, it, you know, you're being forced to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, speaking of that, though, like, did it ever affect 
when you got to work? Like, did you like kind of like bring your mood down or affect how you worked, or did it almost like when once you left, you're in the studio, everything just switches and yeah, I, I I actually needed a hard reset. Um, mm-hmm. There's a thing that I did, and I guess um, some people sort of know me for it is that I used to do dailies, uh, daily drawings every day, daily sketches, paintings. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did it. Uh, I usually get in work a little bit earlier and spend about thirty minutes to an hour uh, just to draw anything, um, and it basically just gets any of my bad ideas, gets any rust off, any. Yeah. Uh, just resets my brain just because like you know when you're in such a horrible commute and you're just being bombarded by you know so much noise and traffic of people your your head's just like in a weird mental space you're just trying to get to point a to point b and i don't want to be doing that when i'm working i need to be actively thinking yeah. about what i'm doing for you know the client at, at the time um so just having a little reset and just having a refresh, get all the bad ideas Mm -hmm. and just have a good think about any drawings that, you know, it's not for anyone else but yourself. Just so you can, when you do your professional work, you're hopefully not doing any particularly crap work. (laughs) I still did crap work, but (laughs) it it did help a little bit. So I mean, you know, I guess that's subjective, um, but I'm sure others have a different opinion and they probably wouldn't see it as crap, but I totally get what you mean. I think that's quite a clever way or... Are probably more a better way to look at every days and stuff like i mean was that a deliberate thing for you to like just pull out your sketchbook or maybe you know op- open photoshop or whatever and just start working or was that just something um that happened like naturally uh i think it was something that was encouraged in our studio um we are uh, my old art director bjorn hurry kind of did it every day and he mm-hmm. used to like stream on twitch and stuff um, but it kind of encouraged the entire team to start doing it. Cool. Um, I'm, especially for myself, I, I personally find that I'm a bit of a slower learner compared to everyone else. I've been kind of, you know, you know I'm, a, a, I'm a C, D grade student on average, a B plus on my best, you know? Mm-hmm. So I, okay. <laughs> so for me personally, uh, maybe I got from my blue collared parents is that you just, I just have to work harder. Yeah. Just, just got to put in more hours. Just got to, because that's the only way it seems to help me learn. Yeah. I, especially when I see a lot more of my like talented uh, co-workers or uh, these students, they just seem to grasp these like very difficult concepts of like yeah. color theory or composition or whatnot a lot quicker than compared to myself. So for myself, it's just repetition. I have to mm. do it often or else, uh, you know, I, I just get lazy or just forget, so. <laughs> I can totally relate to you on that. I'm very much the same, or I've had very similar experiences. Um, like, and I think that's a good way to look at it as well. Like, I guess it's not so much hard work, but the repetition side of things does really help to you to kind of like figure things out and just, just get things sorted, right? Um, did that ever like kind of get frustrating for you though? Or was that almost like this is my little secure cheat code so to speak to kind of get things figured out and get myself up to speed yeah i mean you know i like to i think people like to imagine that their life is a bit like a a video game or rpg if you do it enough times you get enough xp and you'll reach the next level but that's just not how human growth for most people work you know it's you will plateau at points you will hit brick walls you will realize like there's just certain things that are you just not very good at not very good at grasping you know i initially i started out as a uh, character artist it's what i liked initially i did mm-hmm. a lot of figure drawings life drawings that's what i anime manga that's what i liked um but over time the work that was being presented to me was environment work and i had to get better at environment so i had to do more environment studies and such and when I started to study both these things side by side, it turned out like I was learning environments a lot quicker. I understood it a lot more naturally. Mm. Understood color in a bigger context a lot better than you know anatomy or form or gesture of like characters and such. So um, yeah, it, it's it's a little sad that I feel like oh I couldn't couldn't be 
uh, you know, like the berserk artist of character designing, mm -hmm. you know, but um, that's just sometimes just how your brain works. Just your brain just naturally gravitates towards certain things and how it perceives things. Um, yeah, so yeah, there's certain frustrations when it comes to doing this that you will realize what your weaknesses are. And it seems like even though I fought my strength for his character, it turned out it was actually one of my weaker things, and that I was actually better at environment and then i learned that i was better next better at like props and then maybe some hard surface stuff yeah and then way way down it's like characters <laughs> yeah. so, so it's completely yeah. inverted almost yeah almost yeah um and did you prior to that like kind of was did environments ever cross your mind thinking i want to try this or was it more so an interest-based thing where characters is what you really wanted to do hence where that was what your focus was i wanted my characters to be in cool environments and i didn't know how to express myself and environments i think for a lot of people when they look at it it seems like such a big thing to paint or draw right when you look at a huge scene you're like how am i gonna do this like uh you know it, it could be anything just like oh i want to draw my living room or i want to draw like a battlefield or yeah. i want to draw a cityscape when you're confronted by these things, it's it seems so in, such so much more complicated than a character, which just seems like oh, it's, it's singular. But the difficulty is about the same, really. There's yeah. so many elements you have to think, and there's so many smart ways you can break these things down. Still, like breaking it by shapes, um, form, um, you know, just breaking things down into smaller, smaller chunks. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at city cityscape or lots of buildings, you don't think I got to draw, uh, you know, 200 buildings. I You think, okay, I need to make sure I have a background, mid-ground and foreground. Yeah. That's, that's the most simplified form of thinking about it. So, Yeah, I think when I started off, with anything i used to be that guy who used to draw every single building with same, the windows, <laughs> and then i'd be like okay this doesn't look too good and why would i have ink all of a sudden because i've drawn all these little different elements and yeah it took me a while to kind of like do that kind of stuff but interestingly with environments i dabbled in that a little bit and then i realized that almost the opposite like i should kind of like relax figure that out later on because um that's not what my strength is. Um, so it's kind of like similar with obviously the characters for yourself. Um, what was your journey like when you were developing your character skills? Like, is that something that you started off at a young age or what made you want to become a concept artist and enter this industry? I think I fell into it uh, accidentally. Hmm. I think when I was younger, I've always wanted to be in the manga anime industry because that's just right. what I love or comic books, you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, when I did my BA, I did it in fine art and art history. And I was thinking, like, you know, this course would be learning, like, Rembrandt's and Monet's. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it was more like contemporary art, like postmodernist art, yeah. art, where I'm putting, like, I don't know, like this glass of water into a white space and then explaining how this is uh, how society's be viewed or right yeah. <laughs> just like just like a lot of random like, i have respect for it but sure, it's sure. it's not what i wanted to learn as a skill mm. set um i think luckily i had this really um great uh technician and mentor there um his name is martin brooks and he is a uh pro national portrait gallery winner i think oh, cool. um he's just really good at life drawing and he did these life drawing classes uh every friday and they were about uh nine hours long and wow. we'll just and we'll just draw and he'll like guide you on how to draw form and figures and stuff and i think with that portfolio that i got from doing life drawing with this guy i was able to apply to uh central saint martin's for character animation which i thought would be my way to get into anime mm -hmm. and manga um then I quickly learned that I actually don't like animation. I, I, I'm a rubbish animator, you know? Right, right, right. right. Um, um, but, you know, at the time, uh, living in London, I was quite desperate. I needed uh, money as well. So I just applied to, um, you know, concept studios and I was uh, able to get picked up by one, uh, luckily called Opus Art Studios. 
um, and they, you know, looked after me for five years cool. uh, whilst I was studying full time uh, masters, and also working for them like part time. And then they took me on full time once I graduated. Uh, so yeah, it it's it it was something that I just gradually fell into, and then while I was working at Opus Arts, they taught me the ropes for concept art. Um, and even learning character animation was quite helpful as well. You learning all these programs, um, as well. It was like a lot of cross learning. It was quite overwhelming at the time. Okay. Uh, but yeah. And then, you know, as you learn more about concept art, I, I think you learn like there's a lot, lot about concept art. It's very difficult to be a generalist. I think, yeah. I think people who can be generalists are, uh, in a league of their own. Yes. Um, so, you know, learning that you could actually get work substantially just by concentrating on one avenue, I, you know, start to push more towards environments and props and then gradually learning more into environments. And then luckily I, I got offers for freelance for like in the animation industry. So I somehow left the animation industry, went back into the animation industry. Yeah. So it's, it's very, um very strange sometimes these things so yeah but with that journey um looking at it now obviously looking backwards and the beauty of hindsight would you change anything in terms of the path that you took uh and i guess like do you think things would have been markedly different if you had stuck to the original plan and kind of like brute forced it and see what happened like do you think you'd be in an equal place a better place or maybe somewhere completely different or maybe I I think I would have struggled in the animation industry. I, like I said, I'm a bit s slower when it comes to learning these things and uh, not to knock on my course too much, but I felt like they weren't too hands-on with uh, teaching us uh, a lot of fundamentals. Mm. It, it, it felt like a, perhaps, because my course at the time was a two-year MA course, but it felt like it was a three-year course crammed into two years. So it was a lot to learn. And, you know, not, you know, uh, this is another thing is that they, they expect you to learn the fundamentals by the first year. Mm -hmm. And then by the second year that you create your graduation film by yourself. Right. And the reason why I often feel uh, a lot of people look up to like Goblin school, uh, the French animation school, mm -hmm. is that they have three years. And by the time they reach their third year is that they work together as a group like yeah. the large it's a large group of students working on animation film and they often people don't really like uh i guess as a student you don't think of it that way i think as a you know a young man or a woman there's a certain level of ego to being an artist where you think you can do it yourself and you you can achieve this like amazing thing but the whole idea of animation or even games is that it's a huge huge effort of people pushing this, you know, boulder up a hill, it, you yeah. know, it's just, especially once I've now watching, uh, I started working in like professional features. I'm surprised anything gets made. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just yeah. like, I, I don't understand how anything gets made. It's there's so many cogs and wheels to be done. So for my course personally, um, it didn't really help me uh develop very well as a character uh, animator yeah. um for other people who worked for them and they're, they're doing very well uh in london or in europe so yeah um i've had a similar journey i did industrial design and well that was a, a longer course it was four years um it was um yeah i had a similar thing where i was like kind of left it and i was thinking I, it took me a while afterwards realizing that i actually had difficulties at the time I didn't notice it at the time then. I just thought, oh, it's just not clicking or it's not working out. Obviously, I can look back now and really diagnose some of the things that was happening and what fixes I'd make going back now. Um, but yeah, I think there's something about a structure or sometimes some of these courses, the way they are planned out that maybe that I like to learn is doesn't really like sync up and then therefore the results aren't as good. Um, did you find that uh, leaving obviously, you know, the ac academia, so to speak, Excuse me. Um, did you find that you started to learn better now that you could kind of like pick and choose what you wanted to work on as opposed to, I guess, 
what you were told to to learn, which is kind of what you know, like university and stuff like that is. Yeah, I think so. I think, uh, yeah, I, I think maybe some of the education system doesn't work for a lot of people.、Uh, I think me in particular, I, I, if I like a subject, I, I can't stop thinking about it.、Yes. I, I go deep diving into it.、Um, you know, I, I obsess about things. You know, I, I do feel like I have an obsessive sort of personality.、Um, My personal things is mar, you know, like martial arts,、uh, Magic the Gathering cards,、mm-hmm, like、mm-hmm. these weird little things. But once I obsess about it, I can't stop like thinking about all aspects of it. And it's just the same with like environment art and stuff. Yeah. So when I'm, you know, when you're given something that you don't particularly enjoy, I I think a lot of people feel it when it comes to like doing professional work. If you get assigned work that you're like. Uh, that's not my forte, but you know, I need to pay my bills. Kind of sort yeah, yeah, situation. Yeah. It it can be a bit of a slog. So yeah. And now, like looking back, I guess you know your environment work now.、Um, what's the best project that you've worked on? And I guess that's quite like a very maybe rhetorical question because there's different things. Well, like multiple things can be the best for different reasons.、Um, but yeah, like of all the things you've worked on so far, which one is the one that Really stands out to you, or is you know precious to you? Ah、oh, man,、um, yeah. I, I you know what?、Uh, there's been a couple of projects in my life that I felt like turning points for me.、Um, uh, in gaming,、uh, I worked on a project called The Division,、mm-hmm. and I did some like environment pieces. And、uh, I think that was the first time、uh, environment pieces really clicked for me.、Mm-hmm. Uh, looking back, I don't think those art pieces are as good as they could be, but I think. Uh, whatever I learned at the time, whatever was spinning in my brain, yeah,、uh, that was good, you know.、Um, another one was、uh, this animated project that I really love,、um, and I wish it got a sequel. It's called City of Ghosts by Elizabeth Ito、uh, with Chromosphere Studios, and they were actually my first gig into animation. And what has kept me going in animation all these years, really,、um, their little. Project has allowed me just to keep on going and really learn the ropes、mm-hmm. of working,、uh, you know, background painting and、mm-hmm. concepting within the animation because it's co- it's quite different to games.、Um, I often feel like、uh, games take so much longer to develop compared to、uh, animated series or、yeah. or features.、Um, so. The the difference in speed and what was necessarily what was necessary to learn、um, was really f- important for me, and I think the other thing that I thought was great was、uh, obviously uh, uh, across the Spider Verse. That's my background there.、Um, this post I got from a friend、um, was really good.、Uh, just everyone there at the time are at you know. At the top of their game, everyone is, yeah, they're just absolute killers.、Yeah. Bring it on every single day, and it was really hard to maintain that level, but it was really fun to push myself to match everyone. Uh, yeah, that that project was really cool. Just seeing a bunch of high level dudes and girls uh together in one space and just. Absolutely pushing each other and creating amazing work every day.、Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, at the same time, it was very tiring because、uh, you are giving a hundred percent every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And、uh, this you can only maintain that for so long. Yeah.、Um, and also recently, I'm working on this uh, project uh, tentatively called、uh, K-pop Demon Hunters at、uh, Sony. And、um, yeah, it was just the most enjoyable project I've ever worked on. You know. Um, just such a cool team and such talented people. So、mm-hmm. those th- those are the four that have really, really stuck to me. Wow, that's amazing.、Um, and like, I guess when it comes to working, like, like you know, like you said, like seeing you know, like top level people doing their thing. Do you find like it affects? Obviously, it does affect your artwork because you, you are trying to like subconsciously think, okay, I need to maintain a certain level. But do you find that it Adds anything clear to your work that makes any sense? Because sometimes it's more subtle, right? Like it's just、uh, 
you just have a better feeling on certain projects so maybe you know like you have like a different kind of vibe and then sometimes it direct, directly translates into what you deliver like did you notice anything of that happening yeah um this seemed like daily deliverables from everyone um it made me see what they were doing especially when it's a work in progress you you kind of see like how they sort of break down uh for example i i like across the spider verse i was mostly assigned color keys mm -hmm. and seeing people uh, show their color keys at different stages you can kind of see their work process and how they approach color and form and light and yeah just just being seen like little things here and there in their paintings just makes you go like damn i want to do that so you try to add it into your painting of course yeah. when i do it it's worse than how they did it right but um it's just really cool just being able to to see how people like think for their mm -hmm. uh, whips every day so um but yeah at the same time it's also disheartening you know they they come in you you're like ah oh, i think i did pretty good today and yeah, then yeah. they come up with their amazing whatever the hell they did and you're just like oh man <laughs> like that's really good <laughs> that's really really good <laughs> <laughs> but is that like your projection of things or is that literally being yeah scared? that that's like, a that's yeah, a that's yeah, a so. me thing i like cool. they're, they're not like you know making fun of me or cool. uh cool. or cool. like oh yeah your stuff's rubbish compared to mine it, it's more like a, a personal feeling and i often feel that quite often with my work is that my work is not as comparable to my colleagues or other people um, which is probably not true because you know i'm working the same job as them so yeah, yeah, obviously yeah. we must be the, roughly the same level yeah. um but i can't help subconsciously feel that and i don't know if that's just like uh an ego thing like a like mm. i subconsciously i want to do better or mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh or yeah it's just, just kind of like things it's just like i think it's types of like ego human egos that i just need to work out for myself now I, I get it in more ways than you can imagine, man. Um, like, and it's an interesting topic to kind of unpack. Like for me, that happens, but it kind of like happens in the background, but I'm not, is it happening, but it's kind of like at the foreground, but it's still mm -hmm. happening. That makes sense. Almost like, you know, like you got a fan in the background, like it's doing its thing, you know, it's on, mm -hmm. but it's not, you know, like, yeah, maybe it might be distraction. If I, and then if I turn it off, it's kind of like, oh, I can focus a bit more, but I can totally relate in that regard where like, you look at your work, I guess like, you know, like not, not to um, lessen what it is, but like, you know, you got body dysmorphia, like there's a kind of maybe like an art dysmorphia kind of thing or anything that you create, you see it at a lesser value than maybe what it actually is. Mm -hmm. um, I know that's like a common theme with artists where I guess we criminally underestimate and devalue ourselves versus maybe what other professionals do in other industries. Um, but, but, interestingly like you know like looking at your work like your work is elite clearly it's elite oh, but, it's, <laughs> but it's interesting how like you see it in a different light obviously i mean like i guess if someone showed you the exact same work but it was from them not from yourself do you think you judge it the same way or do you think it would look completely different uh what, what do you mean like if they so for example let's say 10 of your pieces yeah i did them but um, exactly the same way you've done them. So let's say they're mine now, they're no longer yours, but yep. I show them to you now. Um, do you think you'd view them in the same way if they were coming from me versus if they were done by yourself? Hmm. I'm not too sure. Uh, I, I think it'd be kind of flattering if, you, if someone copied my artwork one-to-one, -one, but at the same time... Uh, I, I wonder if that person learned anything if they did copy me mm -hmm, one to one. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess that's just kind of like uh, some of the AI stuff, right? You're just like, did you really learn anything if if you just uh, created something almost one to one? And yeah, in like, I I don't know how true this is, but at least I feel like when it comes to style um, or 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 your signature look. Um, is that often it's just whatever fundamentals and stuff you learn, but however you took your way of interpreting and your your versions of shortcuts and your idealizations of color and design 
And that's how I think that's how style, style Asia, and also plus your experiences of the world and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's that's how it works. But if you were just to like, just copy me exactly, it, is there like much of a learning curve, mm -hmm. or is there a reason for it at all? Maybe there is. I I don't know. <laughs> now I don't know. I mean, did you ever enjoy that? We got those assignments for our high school, college, and even university, mm -hmm. which was basically obviously what we call studies, but almost like just copy, try and imitate, so to speak. It's just mm -hmm. like do this and that's it. And th those were some of the most uninspiring and boring activities I ever did in school because it just didn't ignite that part of the creative process that I wanted to ignite. Um, obviously at the same time I totally understand the value of studies now and knowing how to dissect how someone's made something as opposed to like I said before just drawing every single building out as opposed to trying to capture it and represent it as a different scene um, but was that the same thing for you like did you enjoy that when you were going for your education like of looking at um, existing art and other artists and then trying to kind of extract the essence of those or well, yeah, just that felt pointless to yeah. You. So um, I, I think I think my art takes a lot of influence from like people like uh, Rob Rupel, mm -hmm. uh, Sparf, uh, Edwin Earl. Um, you know, a lot of graphic type of artists. Um, and when I do studies, at least that's some. At least no one explicitly told me. I just it just sort of clicked in my brain was mm. that when I was doing all these master studies or photo studies. Um, when I went back to do my professional art, whatever worked in my study, somehow in my brain, I clicked that I could apply this in my painting for professional work. And then the more I did that, I realized that there was a connection to studying and mm -hmm. also professional work and how to apply it. And I think that's maybe the problem with maybe, uh, how people say that you should do studies without really or just copy things without really telling them the purpose mm. is that you should be actively learning whilst you're studying so so sure do your one-on-one -on -one painting or interpretation but then after that maybe make a separate scene uh that is based on the palette or a perspective or, or whatever you learned from that painting mm -hmm. onto a separate painting that's completely unique or nothing to do with that painting itself to see if you actually learn anything from that master of photography, you know. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe that's how I, I would see it, so. And just to go back on the topic of, like, I guess, how you view your own work and, I guess, how it comes across. Um, I guess maybe it would be more dangerous, so to speak. Maybe it's been a bit dramatic, but, like, if you totally loved every single thing you did and thought it was the best thing ever because I guess that's, that, that's not a sign of growth right like learning is supposed to be like okay the next step has got to be better than the last one or the next you know like you mentioned martial arts that's pretty much a lot of like just learning and repetition and just making sure it's better than the last time and you know perfecting and refining things right like yeah maybe, maybe that's the kind of maybe that's a good thing because you're in that zone of like this leads to improvement maybe yeah, I think it's a careful balance of being humble and ego, right? Mm -hmm. I think if you're too egotistical, I don't think you can really survive in this art industry. It's a very small industry. And if you're an asshole or a weirdo, you get caught out pretty quickly. Um, there's no space for, uh, especially how animation or games are made mm -hmm. and how big the teams are and how you need to rely on each and every member. If you're just there just to be like a superhero, I, it's very unlikely that you'll get hired again. Whilst, you know, in martial arts, it's very different. If you're doing it for yourself, I say maybe keep the ego at home. Um, but if you're trying to become like world champion, you probably have to think that you're the best person. You're the best Yes, fighter yes. in the world right you you need to think that you could beat anyone um you know it, it's it's a sort of like self-delusion that you gotta have yeah. but at the same time i think you also need a bit that you go in 
games or or animation in in art in itself is because you want people to see your art you want people to like it you for some people they do want to work for these big studios mm -hmm. you know whether it's your like disney pixars or whatnot um so yeah it's 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 having this careful balance of like yeah definitely have the fire in your tummy to you know to go forward move forward and to create and to be creative and to uh, socialize and to create more work and to seek more knowledge but at the same time don't be like stamping people down don't be like bragging about stuff you know uh that you know in the end it's just drawing yeah, yeah. it's just drawing it's like there's no point being a dick about it so totally totally yeah. and yeah it always baffles me when people do that and i just think like why but you know i guess because i don't really experience that sort of things or do that sort of things i guess i'll never understand because i have no context um but the ego thing is a very interesting topic or like thing to nurture because i've like i guess growing up when you're much younger um it's always been like you know it's about conquering and being the best that's what you see on TV, the things you consume, watching sports or whatever else. And um, that's what it's all about. And then as you get older, that kind of like your relationship changes with the ego, especially when it gets hurt and bruised, which has happened to me many, many times um, yeah. to the point where I thought like maybe it's not needed. And then it's kind of like, like you mentioned, like maybe it's like a little doses or micro dose or just almost be really aware of, I recognize it. And then when it creeps up, what to do afterwards. And I think, when you mentioned there about like in the like in what context does it need to come out and i guess competition is a perfect example of where it can really define the result like really um make the result of what, what who will win and who will lose like especially you know like you mentioned martial arts i'm not too versed on like that area sort of things and i don't want to watch too much of that but i watch a lot of like sports and mm -hmm. especially team sports or like solo sports and to the point where like I, I really try and pay attention to almost like their behind the scenes, their work in progresses, their dailies and see like, okay, what are the steps that they take to achieve the greatness that they achieve? Because it's not just like you turn up and you kick ass and there's very, very few right, people right. that do, mm -hmm. but there's way, way more that goes into it. And there's like teams of people that go into it, but obviously, you know, that's just more elite level stuff. Um, but what has your relationship been with your ego? Like, have you been, burned by it or if you always had it under control and yeah you know like yeah yeah i'd love to hear more of that from yourself yeah yeah that's a that's a difficult one i think uh i think 2020 uh you know was a very difficult year for everyone in, um but for me it was uh very difficult as well uh, in my in my own sort of way i first experienced burnout because I took on too much work because I thought I could do the work. I think at my craziest, I think I was doing four or five projects, doing like 14 to 16 hours a day. And I had this like crazy Excel spreadsheet, like where I knew where like every present, like basically like as long as I didn't get bad feedback, like this, this insane, you know, do you know like the uh, Always Sunny sort of like meme where you're just like, all the things are like pinned up on the oh, walls? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's just like, okay. it was like that. It was just like, oh, if all these cogs are fit perfectly, then it works, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and luckily it did. Uh, but um, unfortunately, I burnt myself out in 2020. I didn't get to um, hang out with friends or anything. So I didn't have an outlet for, you know... Uh, my energy i can't even do my shorts for example um but also uh i had a first massive gig at netflix and it was uh, a huge paying job it would have maybe brought my first house um for myself and my family um but because i was so burnt out at the time um i i should have said no to the project to be honest um, but i took it on as well and I think two or three months in, I was fired. And that was the first job I have ever been fired from. Mm -hmm. So I think that was a case of not realizing I was burnt out and then thinking mm -hmm. that I could just power through things like I've always done, you know, like how I done with my studies. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, and and there was a case that it's it wasn't possible. You know, I I wasn't making deliverables. I I was producing mediocre art, uh, and I I recognize it now. Um, but at the time, it was quite a bitter pill to swallow. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and, and there's also other things happening in my personal life as well. But um, that that was like a personal one, at least in my art journey, where my ego really. Um, really didn't help my life. And also because of the burnout, I also would start developing like uh, like shoulder problems and back problems, like really bad. So, it, and it's taking, I still have them, but I'm, I'm, I'm taking a, a lot more time to try and heal these things that if I'd looked after myself properly, I wouldn't have to deal with it so much now, you know, so. Well, yeah. Um, I've sold many of those pills as well. And a bit too many, I, I, yeah. I hate to admit, but um, yeah, it's kind of like um, having a bit, a bit of dose of venom to kind of cure yourself from it and also kind of like realize that not to do that kind of stuff again. Um, but yeah, firstly, I appreciate you sharing that because um, especially like in this space, it's sometimes we always present the highlights, we always present the good stuff and a lot of the other stuff we kind of like, just because no one necessarily wants to see it or it has no place to be seen but at the same time it's like nice to kind of like just leave that in the you know in the cupboard and let no one see you know the 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 skeleton so to speak but um i do appreciate you sharing that because i guess it like you said it wasn't a positive experience and um i guess like did it take a while for you to kind of like process that or like when you deal with disappointments does it affect you quite badly or is it something that you can like okay i gotta like kind of you keep it together, you kept it together, and then you kind of like got through it and then just moved on. Yeah. Like how does it <laughs> I mean, I, I don't mind telling this because it's something I'm working through myself. Um, at the same time I lost my job at Netflix, my father was passing away from cancer oh, and it was COVID. So uh, it was like so many like complicated things happening at the same time. Um, so when everything happened, I got fired. I just uh, say goodbye to my father. I took maybe a month off and um at the time i was still getting lots of offers we're 20 19 20 21 is a weird time there was so much job offers at the time because everything had to be done remotely and you know people i was very lucky one of the lucky few people who were getting lots of job offers because of my skill sets Mm -hmm. um and you know i i was very open to these people i was telling them my situation and they gave me a lot of time. Um, so when I finally did get back to work a month later, I think maybe at Paramount or something, I can't remember. Um, they were very kind with just easing me into the process again. And I, I also knew that like, uh, because I got burnt out and all these things are happening to my life, I had to take things a lot slowly. So even things that I would have been able to do you know, in half a day's work, maybe it took me a little bit longer, two days, yeah. maybe a week. But I told, I was very transparent with telling them, like, I, 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 I'm still kind of recovering from what I was, and to be honest, I should have took even more time off. And that, mm-hmm. that's, again, that's another part of my ego rearing up. I was so scared. 2020 was such a weird time. I was so scared that I wouldn't have money for my family. Uh, I wouldn't get another job because I got fired for my first job. There was so many weird things like that going from my head. Um, but luckily I have like an incredible wife who, when she sees that I'm teetering towards like overworking or, um, just overdoing myself, uh, she just tells me like, slow down or like, don't, or she'll be like, you know, next month, don't take on any work for a couple months. And that sort of chilled me out as well. I think also, uh, I know we talked about this, uh, off, uh, offline but uh, I also I had a child uh, a couple of years later that's also helped calm me down because I realize uh, another priority in my life is not myself anymore it's it's, it's this like child and my family and I had I had to feel more content about as long as I got a roof over my head food for my family and we we make enough for savings um you know, there's no reason for me just to keep on pushing. I'm pushing for no reason, you know, and just hurting myself every time I, I overdo it. 
um, yeah, just just sort of knowing where your limit is is, is really important, yeah. and having people you can rely on to tell you like just, just like stop it, slow down. Yes. Like you you're gonna do that thing again. So yeah, it's not something that you can cure immediately. I think maybe if I had a therapist, it might help as well. But um, having reliable people, reliable people in your life really helps. So yeah, no, definitely, man. Um, and yeah, therapy is a weird one because it's always like after it happens, you never get like it's not something it's pre-therapy. I don't think that's <laughs> normally called good advice, and we would tend to always ignore that and be like, <laughs> yeah, hey, yeah, we're fine. I remember at school they said, yeah, do revision, plan it in advance. You'll be, you know, you get good marks. We're like, yeah, okay, I'll do it the last day. It's gonna be fine, and you know, um, it never is. Um, but yeah, there's so many things like I can relate to. You in that regard especially with the burnout stuff and do, do you think there's something that you could ever forecast because like you mentioned like you kind of like only until you hit that limit you kind of know there's a limit otherwise yeah. you know I, I, yeah I've, I've i've a better gauge of when it's about to happen for me personally it starts to uh, when i start to autopilot when i work and basically when i'm not it's a very strange feeling it's like i'm doing work but i'm not thinking Mm -hmm. I'm doing everything that I feels like I'm doing work, but I'm not actively doing good design. I'm not putting up my my heart, my heart or feeling into mm -hmm. the work. Then I kind of know that I'm teetering around. That I, basically, when I stop caring about things, that's 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 when I know that it's like, oh, this is a problem now. Like, yeah, yeah, and um, like like so similar things as well. Like I've noticed. But when I've gone through burnout, and it's actually burnt out now, almost to the point where it's like, okay, it's happening. Prepare for the crash landing. Make sure no broken bones. Get up and kind of go again, um, which is also a bad habit. But I didn't realize about myself that my personality changed because I always thought that I'm doing this, it's fine. Like, I'm okay, I'm normal. You know, I'm doing my thing. And obviously, my wife would tell me that when you're in this mode, you are like this. Or I can tell when you're, like, should ask if similar, similar, similar to yourself as well. We're like, okay, something, something's going on. What is it? Let's let's find out what it is and let's address it. Otherwise, if I wasn't told that, then in my head, everything was normal. When in fact, I was actually driving on the wrong lane of the road against traffic and me thinking that, you know, I'm, I'm actually on the right side of the road and everything's fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, But yeah, it's like, how do you... So let's say you've had a burnout or you deliberately like, okay, I'm going to stop now because I need to prevent this. What is it that you tend to do? Is it like literally nothing? Or is it completely switch away from the task at hand? Do you have like any kind of go-to things that you do? Like, is it something that is more like, like that spreadsheet where you got like all these little things that need to happen? Or is it more like, okay, I'm just going to go with the flow and mm. there's certain things I want to do because I know that's going to lead to something more positive or at least to kind of like... Yeah, out. yeah. I Because of the way I, I was working at the time, I was doing, you know, 14, 16, seven days a week, every day for like three to five months is insane um first time i just switched off completely just everything just even like not really checking my phone or anything just like but you know i i think i unconsciously did that and it's it helped me at the time now that i've experienced it once or um teetered close to it a couple of times for me and, and now that the world has sort of opened up since pandemic uh i sort of um allow myself a lot more freedom um like either meeting friends for coffee mm -hmm. um going to the gym um hanging out with friends you know um making sure my weekends are free um just to hang out with my family or friends um just like little things like that mm -hmm. just like really helps and just getting away from my computer really helps me like decompress and really gives me a little reset um there's, I think there's no hard and fast way to get out of burnout. It, it is very much like a mental thing for a lot of people. Yeah, definitely. Um, but for me, it, it certainly feels like just spending time away from the computer and being around with people I love and care about, it, it really does seem to help me and seems to ground me a lot better. Um, yeah so that, that's what i would say for myself <laughs> i don't know if it works for other people but now, I, I like again just to and i guess maybe there's, there is a common thread here because for myself it's it's also similar things as well like really appreciating just switching off and spending time with family and really making 
the most of that. Not to be like, obviously, there's like, I guess, when you have a family, you have certain roles, right? You have like, you know, the, I guess, what your function is in terms of make sure things operate, whether it's like, you know, you're the main breadwinner or whatever else it might be, there's that element. That's just like, I guess, the mechanical element. There's also the emotional element, or just even building experiences. And if you don't do that, then memories are not made, and then, you know, it all kind of like just falls apart, so to speak, and it's not a healthy dynamic. Um, and also, when you have kids, watching them grow and making sure that, you don't miss the good things that's can also hurt as well sometimes um so yeah having that kind of like i guess you know north star so to speak to kind of like keep you in the right direction mm -hmm. can can really help um do you think a lot of this is though is the curse or maybe the downside or just a natural byproduct of freelancing because if this happened when you're in studio do you think it would have happened to this effect or maybe not at all um you know what, I, I do think like even in studios, I I was teetering around burnout, but mm -hmm. because I had a better work, work-life balance, it kind of kept it away. I, I did remember there was a few, probably a few times in my life at the studio where I just didn't want to be at the studio. I didn't, you know, care about whatever I was drawing, even if it was a super cool project. Um, But what kept me from doing like burning out fully at the studio was having cool co-workers, um, being able to get out of the studio and just, you know, whether, whether it's go to the pub or go to the gym and, oh. and blow off some steam and stuff. Um, and of course, like London is so interesting and fun, you know, just going to a museum or something yeah. and sketching. Um, there was so many things that kept it away. But since freelancing, I guess this is one of the cursor of freelancing is that you are mostly at home you know, every day, you know, you're stuck in this office. For me, you know, it's it's also part of my living room uh, where I am. Um, so being stuck in a space like this every day, and you think it's fine because you're in a familiar and safe environment. Mm -hmm. um, it, you don't realize that this could also become a bit of a prison for yourself as well. So yeah, just just realizing that it's, it's really important. I also freelancing is for for mm, yeah freelancing can be quite difficult for some people if they don't get consistent work as well and that's one of the biggest fears for myself mm -hmm. so just taking on ex taking on work when you already have work or staggering work or just jumping project because you don't know it just because you have work this month doesn't mean you have it next month for example um that that's also a recipe for burnout, you know. Mm -hmm. I think typically as a freelancer, I I think we're often called as like, you know, a guerrilla fighting force. You know, we we're usually brought in right when production's the busiest, or just when they need some extra legwork for a couple of days or weeks. And it's usually very like they know that you can work fast. They knew know you got the skill set. And it has to be like, bam, 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 bam. Like you, you got to hit the targets as a freelancer, you know, um, there's not much wriggle room, like in a studio space where there is, uh, a margin of error that you can kind of like stay relaxed because every day you're charging your client money, you know, and they expect you yep. to produce good work. Whilst in studio life, there's at least, you know, the safety net, you know, hopefully your art director is nice and mm -hmm. say like, okay, this needs a bit more time. Let's hand it in next week, maybe, you know, yeah. so there's things like that. And um, I could probably name more stuff, but those those are the obvious ones that come to my head. Yeah. Um, and now totally, totally get you and I totally relate. But at the same time, there's the positive side to it as well. And um, like you mentioned about getting, you know, um, bought in to deliver, I guess you do get like a kind of kick out of nailing what you've been asked to do delivering it on time maybe even before time and obviously doing stuff as well but like what are your favorite parts of freelancing as well and sometimes it's the same thing but on the other scale of the negative side but yeah what, what is it for you uh well of course i said uh just having more time for your family for yourself at home <laughs> uh it's a bit silly but yeah just just having extra time not spent on commuting and stuff is yeah. great um but I also think having flexibility in projects is also um, something that I enjoy. I mm -hmm. remember being on projects for 
especially if you work for like um a big big brand sort of like an activision or or ea and you get brought on a team you're often on one project for a year to three years just working on one game and i think that could be quite um you know it kind of you kind of lose steam along the way and freelancing can be quite exciting you're on new projects all the time you get new uh new puzzles to solve every time you're like most of the time when people come for you they look for something that suits your portfolio and the puzzle is usually quite different every time and that's mm -hmm. that could be quite fun for people mm -hmm. um another thing about freelancing uh i mean yeah i don't know i that, that's all i can think of right now yeah. uh yeah and you mentioned there about um having a variety of projects mm -hmm. how would someone like would you advise somebody to kind of make that happen so to speak because obviously clients approach you first most of the time um mm -hmm. but like how how have you been able to diversify the kind of projects that you is it more so a case of being selective with what you take or is it more like in the work that you put out making sure that it attracts all the different types of clients like is there a certain thing that you're doing deliberately maybe that is enabling you to get a variety of projects yeah i think it's a bit of both i think um you know especially now that we're in a, like a social media age a lot of artists just put their artwork out online and share it with everyone it's a lot easier than sharing your own personal website so and uh you know a lot of art directors and stuff are always actively checking their social medias uh to see you know the the next best artist or cool stuff online um i think what you put online often is what how people perceive you even if it's uh, untrue or true um so when i just put a lot of like colorful environments i often get work that's based on environments or colors and that's really helped me get work that's specified to environments or colors i do get offers for things that are uh m maybe not so much that but i do often turn them down because i you know i'm not interested mm -hmm. um but more often than not i do get work that is more catered to my strengths as opposed to my weaknesses um you know you, you may get the odd one where they're like oh do you want to do like sci-fi creatures and i'm like i where in my portfolio has sci-fi creatures <laughs> yeah. what are you doing like <laughs> um but yeah I, I think just what you share online is really important sometimes and if you're sharing things online that you don't necessarily want to work on then maybe that's not uh something you should do as much and if you do maybe just keep it to yourself you know um and with all the different projects that you've worked on obviously you mentioned games films animations feature length all of that stuff in between um do you switch gears in terms of like do you approach each project differently and whatever you notice that are like makes i guess all these different things that you've worked on distinct from one another in terms of like maybe genre or the medium like if you mentioned games like tends to be a bit longer on games versus the other ones which is more shorter like do you find that your approach is the same on all of them or do you find that you have different i guess tactics and workflows for the different projects that you do yeah there's no I don't think there's any set workflow with these things. I you often, of course, you learn the pipeline, and you learn that uh, in in feat and like animated features or music videos, the, the pipeline is very quick. Um, but the way I approach uh, the results of my drawings are still the same. It's just that I've just got to figure out. So maybe in vi video games, they want me to design an environment uh, because the time's longer. I'll give them maybe like. 12 thumbnails you know whilst in uh an animated feature i know that they've only got so much time and budget so maybe i'll only do three um, but i make sure those three are really good you know it's mm -hmm. like 12 thumbnails worth um so it's just different different ways of approaching things uh but in like short amount of times and from all from your journey so far what is i guess the best thing that you've learned or picked up that has really that that's for you that's like okay that was a game changer or that is something that if I didn't know this then everything would fall apart. Uh, 
Uh, it's probably, I mean, just having like, just my fundamentals, really just, uh, yeah, just always going back, like, especially if I get stuck on any idea, no matter how complex an image is, it, it still kind of falls back to the old, like, you know, it's, is your perspective right? Is your, yeah. is your values correct? Um, just checking everything. It just all, always helps just no matter how good you are, you still need to go back and check on those yeah. things. So. And I know you mentioned, obviously, like the way you learn and the time it takes. Were you always kind of crude on with fundamentals early on? Or was that something that you kind of maybe neglected? Or what was your relationship with the fundamentals? Starting yeah, out? so that's that's actually one of the things that I've always uh, felt like I could have done better on because, um, you know, I don't come from a pure, uh, you know, you know, like how these a lot of these kids from like these Cal Arts or Idea Academy, um, a lot of them come, these young like kids, you know, 18 years old, and they're immediately learning the best fundamentals for concept art or animation. Uh, I, I never really had that. I, I went immediately into character animation with not very good character design skills. And I went into concept art with no idea of that much on basic concept or like shape or design or values. I didn't, I didn't really know about that stuff, you know? So a lot of my things that I learned had to be hodgepodge along the way, uh, you know, picking up from my, uh, coworkers and men mentors and stuff, they just, you know, and just listening to people watching art tutorial videos. So I don't even know if what I've learned is correct, to be honest. It's some, I think it kind of works, but, um, it's a bit of a patchwork. And I think going back to your older question that you asked me earlier on, I do wish in hindsight, if I knew that I would have loved working in animation or, and concept art or viz dev so much that I wish I went to a school that specialized in it. But I think maybe at the time when I was studying, there wasn't that many these types of schools. And if there were, they were quite expensive. So it's not like how you had learn squared and there's lots of cool tutorials for affordable prices. So, <laughs> yeah. That that's interesting. Cause I think like, yeah, I was educated in an area where this wasn't around either. Um, or at least the level it is now. And obviously the generation that have, ha have access to these things. Um, and then I guess people like myself who didn't have that are kind of like going backwards and, you know, kind of like figuring the older stuff out. And it's interesting how, different journeys and stuff i guess it's a bit like are you using top gun maverick right yeah um you know you got like tom cruise who did the analog way and the older versions you got the the new guys with the you know the the top high technology all that kind of stuff and it kind of all merges together where everyone kind of you know like the skills eventually cross over and everyone kind of completes the the game and gets 100 completion um mm -hmm. when maybe you know like you kind of miss certain bits before um Moving away from, I guess, the professional side, you mentioned you get obsessed about things. You mm -hmm. mentioned a couple of things you get obsessed about. What was your last biggest obsession? Last biggest obsession? Uh, the one that you kind of like, you notice, okay, I'm, I'm going deep into this. The rabbit hole is fully, you know, the entrance is gone. I don't know where that is. I'm definitely in this. Like, like I was in the rabbit hole and now I got out or I'm still in that rabbit hole? Either one, whichever one, <laughs> whichever one you remember. Oh, man. I mean... I'm always, I'm always playing magic cards. <laughs> I'm always, uh, I, I play a format called, uh, commander. It's like a hundred card format. And I'm always just like checking up on the, especially art. I love the art on magic cards in particular. And I, I was actually recently lucky enough to do some artwork for them. Um, but yeah, I'm just obsessed about, uh, just, um, you know, also another thing as a father now, I, I can't, I don't have much time to play video games. So I have to like cut down on all the types of games that I like. And it seems like the last one that got cut was magic cards. Right, so that's, okay. that's, I put all my <laughs> time and effort into it and it's so expensive and such a time sink. I don't recommend people doing okay. it, but that's, <laughs> that's just how I ended up. So. Wow. So that's a rabbit hole you got dragged out of, right? Like you didn't want to get out and you got pulled out yeah. of that rabbit hole. Um, what about like, I guess, influences? Like when, when you're growing up, maybe even now, like what were the things that really, I guess you could say, whether you knew at the time or not, really 
led you to the path you're on today? Yeah. Um, influences, huh? It could be. I guess. I guess you could be like you know, film, movies, even artists, individuals. Yeah. I. Yeah, they're not really like artist type. Well, I guess they are artists. Um, I I I often quite like like Bruce Lee, um, Muhammad Ali. Um, I don't know. I I grew up in like a uh, a, in a town that was uh like ninety nine percent white people, and I was like one of the only Asian kids. My best friend's like half Filipino, uh, and I sat and we sat on like a table where there was like. You know, one one kid from Rwanda, one kid from Poland, <laughs> and then the, there's two Asian kids there. Yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah. why they put us all on one table, <laughs> but there was something about it that I always felt like um, uh, I, I I sort of felt like I had the cards stacked against me or something. So I when I, when I uh, learned about Bruce Lee and his struggles in like Hollywood. And how his film sort of influenced a generation of people towards martial arts and stuff. It sort of ignited this feeling that I, I could do better. I I can show people that I could do better and stuff. That I'm not just like another like, um, my like a token minority or something mm-hmm. in in the, in the classroom or something. So I always wanted to somehow stand out outside of just my like maybe my ethnicity or or color that i i do have skill sets beyond that um maybe so uh yeah uh, something like that maybe so now that's that's a powerful one and those those two guys you mentioned there like literal definition of what an icon is or icons like like the legacy will forever be timeless unless for sure yeah. earth gets wiped out for some reason <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what could cause that potentially um but yeah man like the, the to the point where like i don't think i've i definitely haven't studied them to the point where i know about their journey in detail or like i just know their legacy i know their importance and even that alone is still profound and it can have an impact and i like that because it's there's something powerful about an artist whose influence is not necessarily another artist or another thing that's directly art although you could say what they did either indirectly or directly was a form of art um i think that's almost like another cheat code as well like if you can grab influences or have influences that are not almost art related you get these extra ingredients that no one else you know can you can even think of Mm -hmm. um and like with your relationship i guess with bruce lee and muhammad ali like is that something that's kind of like stuck with you as you've gone through life or is it almost yeah like yeah. back to that moment as a child in that experience at school yeah i i i think i still keep like quite a competitive nature but of course i'm trying to keep that ego down um but at the same time um a lot of uh, for example for muhammad ali um he sort of fought a little bit for human rights in particular uh, especially during like the Vietnam War and for black people in America. And even though I'm not black myself or American, um, I saw, uh, you know, I saw myself in that as well. You know, I, 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 I also wanted to fight for people's rights and also want to fight for, uh, you know, things that I care about. So, uh, yeah, they they've sort of influenced me in like weird ways that I didn't expect, yeah. especially like art. I don't know why it would, <laughs> but you know, there's the sort of things that have arisen the last couple of years about how, um, you know, pay uh, equality or how people are treated in workplace, and these things sort of like when they arise, I I get quite disgusted by them, and I. Mm-hmm. If there's a chance to like talk about it or protest against these sort of things, I I like to try to. Um, yeah, I can't say I'm like the best you know, number one protester, but if I see injustices in the workspace, I I don't I hope I don't stay quiet about these sort of things. So, well put, man. Um, I guess a few more things for myself, then then we can wrap it up. And before we wrap it up, um, just any words from yourself or advice to the listeners um long-time listeners current professionals and ones that are starting out but 
A question for myself. Um, a bit back to what we mentioned before. You mentioned four projects that are like highlights for yourself, a mixture of turning points and you know, just highlights in your career. Um, of those, if if possible, like were there any unique things that you took from them? Like as in like maybe uh, a takeaway or a philosophy change or a tip or whatever that you never had before. If that makes sense. Hmm. I think I think maybe uh, in across the Spider Verse, just like certain efficient ways that I could approach my work and the way I could see shapes and colors. Um, uh, yeah, there there was some like you know of course uh, you guys had Patrick O'Keefe, my art director, um, but even people like Aurelian uh, Pradol was I was working with him at the time, at the same time, and just seeing how they did their updates or cat's eye for example as well um yeah just really eye-opening for me i i wouldn't have approached working in that way before then and when i saw how they did it especially when you see all the whips you put them together you can see like a work in progress it's really cool to see how things slowly get refined um it's hard to explain these things but um when i saw it it, it blew my mind <laughs> so yeah well my report man um and yeah any final thoughts or words to the listeners yeah i think up? i think yeah don't worry about what how people are perceived online you know just because they're you know super hot shots and stuff um you know there's uh you don't know about the struggles that maybe that goes behind that and they only showing you what they only showing you what they want to show you know it doesn't show you the struggles and stuff and even if you would want to be number one um don't rush it man there's no point rushing these things especially art if you if you're going to work in art it's going to hopefully it's going to be a lifetime sort of uh you know it's not it's got just it's going to be a full-time career, you know. It's going to last you for your entire life. So take your time. Don't rush these things. I know everyone wants to be a celebrity, but um, this, this is not the real end goal. It's, it's about self-development at the end of the day. So. Henry, wise words. It's a pleasure chatting with you, and this is great, man. Uh, thanks for jumping up. Thank you. A massive thanks to Henry for sharing his journey and giving us some profound takeaways and insights. Be sure to hit the links to check out Henry's work and see what he's up to. And then head on over to Learn Squared to work on your career some more. Perhaps take Henry's Across the Spider-Verse production designer, Patrick O'Keefe's course, 2D Sequence Illustration. Just go to learnsquared.com, sign up and start your journey today. I've been your host Aaron Danda. Till next time.